have you ever felt that when reading the Bible, and I know many people say to me, oh, I've read the Bible, but I don't understand it. Uh, I, it doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't, I just can't kind of work out how it applies to my life or what, 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 what it's saying. And, and, and so I and often find people feel that the Bible is boring or they feel that the Bible is not relevant to them uh, for, whatever, for, for whatever reason. And, um, and so if you're like that today or you've ever felt like that, um, then you've picked a good week to come to church because this week I want to show a little bit about how the Bible uh, how God wants to illuminate the Bible uh, to each of us so that the light comes on, we can see what God wants us to see. Because unless he reveals it, we are, uh, as it were, in the dark. Uh, so week one, we looked at uh, inspiration and how uh, the reasons that God gave us the word of God, uh, what he wants us, uh, to, how he wants it to work in our life, the power that it can have and the effect it can have on our life, uh, last week, we looked at the foundation uh, of, uh, of God's Word in our life and how that kind of affects us. And uh, this week, we're going to look at the issue of illumination. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm wearing glasses. Now, I need glasses to read. And, uh, and one of the reasons for that is not just that it is, uh, uh, makes the text clearer, but one of the things that I found was that I was having to, when I, to read the text I needed more light. So I found that if, uh, if I was reading something, I, I couldn't read it because there wasn't enough light. Um, and so what, what my glasses do for me when I'm reading is they enable me to be able to have more light and clarity on the text uh, when I'm reading. And so that's important, isn't it? So in other words, when we have more light in the situation, things are clearer and you can understand things, yes? So I believe that's important for that. So brightness um, brings clarity. So in other words, if you're going to have a portrait, ladies, if you're going to have a portrait done at all, then you don't want the light to be very bright. You want the, you want the light to be a bit more subtle and kind of hide some of the flaws, some of the things that are kind of... And so if you ever look at portraits, um, they're always done in duller light because they're trying to kind of hide uh, some of the imperfections and the things to make us look better. Because the thing is, in the darkness, you can't see things. There are a lot of things that are there. So if, for example, if we were to turn the lights out in this building, <coughs> excuse me, then we would have always, always lots of lights on. But it's only where the light is that we can see. And so, as, uh, as the guys have put the, the light on me, you can see me, you can see me clearly. I don't know if anybody's still here or whether you've all left now, mind you. Um, but what, what that does is it illuminates, so it makes it clear, doesn't it? But if I was in darkness you would not be able to see me. You would not be able to see. It doesn't mean that I'm not there. It just means you cannot uh, see things. And so that's what the Word of God does. So thank you, guys. Really appreciate that. Put the lights on. They can um, make notes uh, as they wish. Thank you. Uh, and so <coughs> illumination is where the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the Word of God so that when we read the Bible... The Holy Spirit helps us to see what we haven't been able to see. It's always been there, but we haven't always seen it. And I don't know if you've ever had um, that times when you're reading the Bible and you've read something and you've read it many times and then suddenly it seems like, Eureka, I can see something that I couldn't see before and how it applied to your life at that specific moment in time. You see, when Jesus went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit so that each one of us can have the Holy Spirit living in us and helping us to know what God wants us to do so that we can see what God wants uh, us to see. And so one of the things that I don't know about you, but often we get Christmas presents 
And uh, the big question with a Christmas present is, are the batteries included? So, for example, I have a torch here. Now, if this was given to me as a, a thing and there's no batteries in, it's still a torch. It still has the capacity for light. But if it doesn't have batteries, it's not going to light up. It needs to have the batteries. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes into our life because the Holy Spirit switches on the light so that you and I can see the Word of God. We can see what God wants for us to do. And so it's important for us that we uh, understand that. Yes, that the, 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 it's the batteries that make a thing go. It's still a toy. If you get a toy for Christmas, you can still play with the toy, but it's not going to have the full potential of what it can be to you unless the batteries are included. And so it is when we're reading the Word of God, if you read the Word of God and you don't have the Holy Spirit helping you to illuminate it to you so that you can see what God wants you to see, you're going to be in the darkness. And so the Holy Spirit's job is to illuminate the Word of God to each one of us. John 14 and verse 26, Jesus said this, The counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He will teach you all things. John 14, 17 says, He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. And 16 verse 15 says, The Spirit will take from what is mine, in other words, the words of Jesus, and make it known to you. Yes? So that's what the Holy Spirit means to us. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to us. Ephesians 1 says this, I ask the glorious Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you his Spirit. The Spirit will make you wise and let you understand what it means to know God. What does that mean? It means batteries included. Yes. In other words, it is a supernatural book that needs, we need it to be illuminated to us so that we can understand it. And so when we read the Word of God, we say to ourselves, Holy Spirit, what does this mean? What does this mean to me? Yes? Or how can this make a difference in my life today? Yes? How am I meant to use this today and God uses it? And I hope that as you have started through the 40 days in the Word that you have had opportunities to use the things that you have learned through the day. Yes? That you've been able to uh, refer to them and to be able to use them. I have. Uh, I have used some of the ones, particularly the, the, the video daily devotions that just some of them have kind of come in and so powerfully uh, worked uh, in my life and I've been able to, uh, uh, to put that. So the Holy Spirit whispers to us. He gives us impressions. He gives us thoughts in our mind and questions so that we can ask the right questions of the text so that the text is opened up to us. So how does illumination work? Well, Ephesians chapter 1 explains it. It says this, I pray also that the eyes of the heart, what? Our heart has eyes? <laughs> That's very strange, is it not? Yes? Well, I'll explain that in a minute. But I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, illuminated as it were, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. You might want to circle that, the eyes of the heart, yes? You see, when you are born physically, you have physical eyes. You have five senses that you are using. And everything that you experience in life comes through those senses that God has given to us. And so when we are born spiritually, when we give our life to Jesus, we are born again. We have 
spiritual senses. And God gives us spiritual senses for us to use. And God wants us to use them to be able to experience him and experience his word through our spiritual senses when we are born into the family of God. And so it isn't until you have a relationship with the Lord that you can really have these senses. So you're going to get some spiritual ears. You're going to get some spiritual eyes. You're going to have a spiritual mouth um, that's going to be able to, to, to speak the words of God. 2 Corinthians talks about that. He talks about uh, having the eyes, uh, the spiritual eyes and the things that we say, we talk in spiritual words, very powerful uh, things there. And so we feel things spiritually as well. So you and I live in two worlds. Well, if you've given your life to Jesus, you live in two worlds. You have been born physically and you have been born spiritually. You are alive physically and you are alive spiritually. So you are able to see things from both perspectives, yes? <coughs> We've got to remember that it's the spirit world that created the physical world. So the spirit world is the foundation for the physical world. So the most important is the spiritual side because the physical started at a point in time and will end at a certain point in time, but the spiritual will last for eternity. Your bodies, you and I, we look at each other and you look at me and think, what a handsome guy. But that's not going to last forever, yes? If you look at the building, the building is not going to, at one time, at some point, it is going to be destroyed. It's going to, to, it's going to be either bulldozed or it's going to collapse, it's going to decay, whatever it is. So everything you see in the physical realm is, at some point, going to fall apart. But, uh, but God, his angels... And the Holy and the Spirit, your your spirit, your soul that you have in your in, inside of you that you can't see is going to last for eternity. And so it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, your spiritual eyes, will be enlightened. Yes? The Greek there for enlightened is the word for tizo, which quite simply we get the word photo from. And what is photo? Well, it's an image of light that is um, that's imprinted onto a piece of paper or it's digitized or whatever. And so it just means a photo is when you show somebody a photo, you are showing them the light image on something. Yes, because photo means light. And so when you're reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit wants to to, to fortizo your eyes so that you can be enlightened and you can see things that you cannot see normally. And so I believe that's important for us. So, <clears throat> what are the benefits? Well, when God opens our eyes, the first thing that we do is we see the solution. When God opens our eyes, we're able to see what we cannot see. Now, I don't know if you're about you, about you but often... I have lots of things in life, sometimes they're little things, whatever, but lots of stuff. And uh, you're thinking now, what is the solution to this problem? And what I find so often is, though, is that I see a solution, but it's not always the right solution to the problem. And uh, in other words, it's not God's way of meeting it. So, for example, when we have been reading through this last week about the feeding of the 5,000, yes, and, uh, and where Jesus, uh, where the, the, the disciples say to Jesus, um, all these people, the crowds, the multitudes, they're hungry, let's send them away so that they can go into the villages and the towns, uh, they can go into the marketplace and buy some food. And Jesus says to them, you feed them. I don't know about you, but if I was one of the disciples there and Jesus said that to me, I'd be kind of going, can you not see that I don't have an ounce on me? I don't have any money. I don't have any bread. I don't have anything that I can offer. But Jesus says, okay, let's go and have a look and, and find what he can. They come back with it. So what I'm saying is Jesus' way of meeting and the solution to the problem is often very different 
to our way of, solu- of solving something. That doesn't mean to say that the disciples' way was the wrong way, but the best way is God's way. And God wants to illuminate us to that so that we can see this is what God wants us to do. And so I think a great illustration of this is in Genesis chapter 21. <coughs> now you may be very familiar with this, and you may never have heard of it, And you may want to look it up in Genesis 21. But this is the story of Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Now, they they have, uh, Sarah has a handmaid. She uh, uh, She has someone who looks after her needs, who kind of does all the things for her. And uh, some of you may have come from cultures where you have had people that have done your washing, looked after the kids and done all those kind of things. Um, And so Hagar was really someone who... Uh, was a slave woman, and um, and um, but but the story goes on about how Abram has been told by God that he will have a child, he will have a son, and through him he will become the father of many nations. Now, of course, as he's getting old, he gets to about ninety years of age, and so uh, his uh, his wife. Uh, Sarah is saying, look, I'm beyond the age of childbearing. It's not possible any longer for me to have children. And so um, uh, she says, Sarah comes up with the idea, why don't you go uh, with my uh, handmaid, uh, Hagar, and, uh, and see if you can have a son with her. So, of course, Abram is quite probably delighted with that. And so he uh, has a child, she has a child, does Hagar and the child begins to grow. Now, of course, this then becomes a source of tension because now uh, Ishmael, uh, Hagar's son, is entitled to everything because he is the firstborn son. He's actually the only son in their family. And Abraham is a very wealthy man. He has a lot more wealth uh, than, than many people around. He, the, the Bible talks about his great, great wealth. And so as a result of that, Sarah then says that's not going to happen. Um, And so she arranges for Abram to throw Hagar out. And when Hagar goes out with her son Ishmael, they're basically left to go uh, into the wilderness to go out and where there's there's no food, there's no water, there's no sign of hope. And so she eventually, after walking quite a great distance, she puts Ishmael uh, 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 under a tree and she sits away from him because she doesn't want to watch him die. Are you with me? So this is the situation. So I want you to, to be now into, uh, into Hagar's situation. She is now thinking, I need water, but there's no sign of water. Uh, I need some food, no sign of food. I'm going to die, and my son is going to die. That's what she's done, but she, she prays uh, to God about it, and um, we find this, uh, let's see if I can find it, <clears throat> uh, a bit later on, verse 13, well, start from verse 14, early the next morning, Abram took some food and skin of water and gave them to Hagar, he set them on her shoulders and then set her off with a boy, so he's kicked her, off out, kicked her out of the house, she went on her own and wandered in the desert of Beersheba, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy Ishmael under one of the bushes, then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, which isn't very far of my bow shots, but anyway, um, but for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift up the boy and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And the Arab nations come from Ishmael. So that, that is something, you know, when you, when you want to say, is the Bible true? That's a great thing. Yes, the, the nation of Israel is here because of Abram. The Arab nations are here because of Ishmael. They are proof of the word of God outlying from that. And then verse 19, we pick up the story again on your outline. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and she filled the skin, that's like a little canteen, with water and gave the boy a drink. The point is that the well was always there. 
but she couldn't see it. And God opened her eyes to see what she couldn't see before. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to give us a fresh perspective. He wants to see things that we haven't seen, things that are there, but we haven't seen them because we are blinded, because the light hasn't been put on into uh, life. And so that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to illuminate our mind and, uh, and help us to see what we cannot see. Second story, point two, is we see the barrier to our progress um, when we have our eyes op- opened. We're able to say, okay, this is an obstacle that needs to be overcome. And maybe you're here today and you have some obstacles, you have some problems, you have some difficulties in your life and you don't really know what to do or you've tried things and it's not working for you, you've tried to start a business and you've just come across obstacles and you can't see your way forward, wanting to start a family and you're just having obstacles, you're in debt and you want to get out of debt and you can't see your way out of debt. You know, somewhere or other you're trying to make progress in life and all you're doing is coming up against an invisible wall in your life and you're kind of thinking I just don't get it I don't understand why it's not working for me why I kind of just things just seem to be a blockage in the way and so what we need is we need to have our eyes opened to see what the obstacle is in order to be able to deal with that and so a great story of that is Numbers chapter 22 in Numbers 22 it's a story of a guy named Balaam And Balaam is a prophet of God. um, uh, But the problem was is Balaam agreed to help the bad guys. He agreed to help those who were coming against the children of God, the people of of God. And um, and so God's not happy with him. And as a result of that, um, God uh, gets angry with him and, uh, and kind of his thing is saying, you're not meant to be helping the bad people, you're meant to be helping the good guys. And so Balaam starts on his journey to go and help the bad people. And uh, God puts an angel in his pathway. Balaam's riding his donkey and, uh, and uh, God puts an angel in his, in his way and, uh, and he's in an angel way with, a, with his sword drawn. You know what that means if your sword's drawn? Trouble is ahead. And so the donkey sees the angel, but Balaam doesn't see the angel. Yes? And so the donkey goes running off into the field. As a result of that, Balaam's not a happy chappy. And so what he does, he gets angry with the donkey and he beats the donkey and then he sets him back on, gets on and carries on the journey. And then the angel then moves a little bit further where there's, uh, there's, there's um, uh, two vineyard walls and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's narrower and the angel's there and the donkey comes to it. And so the donkey this time tries to squeeze past the angel and, in, and as doing that... Um, Balaam's foot is hurt in the process. So guess what Balaam does? He thinks what a wonderful donkey for avoiding the angel. But he can't see the angel, so what does he do? He gets angry and he beats the donkey. That's right. And so you think to yourself, surely you're going to realise something. So anyway, third time, third time, um, he's going down. This time, the angel goes between two, two narrow walls so that they cannot get past. The donkey can't do a little swerve or anything like that. And this time, the donkey's really wise. He just lies down under Balaam and goes, I'm going no further. You see, this is really quite important because up to this point, he's not done it. And Balaam's about to beat him again. And the angel gives the donkey the power to speak. I know it's a weird story, but you've got a talking donkey. Yes, now this doesn't just happen in Shrek. I know you've got Shrek in your mind and think anyway, but, um, but um, obviously they've taken the image of Shrek and brought it from this story. Maybe that's where it goes. But anyway, so he, he talks to him and the donkey talks to, to Balaam and says to him, look, Have I not been faithful all these years? Have I always been and done what you've asked me to do? Why then when you see me now not doing what you think I ought to be doing, do you you not kind of 
comprehend it, Balaam. Do you know? And at that moment, God opens the eyes of Balaam and he sees the angel with sword drawn and he falls on his knees. He has now seen what he couldn't see. And sometimes there are barriers in our way because God is protecting us and we just need God to reveal them and for us to be able to see. God is saying, change your ways, change the direction. And for some of us, we're going and we think we're going this way and that way don't work. So we go this way and we try this way and we go this way. We try all different ways to go. But God is looking for us to have our eyes open, which the Word of God will do because through the Holy Spirit, He will put the batteries in our life and we will be able to see. Do I need to leave the light on as a reminder? (coughs) His barrier to progress was invisible. He couldn't see it. And so it was the Lord who opened his eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. So if plans aren't working out in your life, there's a blockage in your life. You're trying to go whatever different ways to try to get around it. And probably one of the things is you're probably getting mad. You may be getting mad at the wife. You're probably getting mad with the kids. You might be getting mad with your donkey or the cat, whatever. You might be getting mad with your boss and talking about it behind his back. Whatever it might be, there's also things. All you're seeing is what you're seeing. You're seeing that you're not able to kind of, uh, you know, make progress. And so it's your boss's fault that you're not getting promotion. Uh, it's, uh, It's your spouse's fault because you're not able to kind of do this or do that. And we're always looking to blame someone else. Why? Because we don't see what the real problem is. And God wants us to see the real problem. Why is blocking us? Because so often God is blocking us to protect us. He's stopping us from doing something stupid. He's saying to us, if you keep going that way, you're going to end up in more bother. But you can keep pressing on, but it's going to cause you pain down the road. And so we need to understand that. That when progress is blocked, you've got two choices. Beat the donkey or ask God to open your eyes. They're the two choices that you have in life. Because when God opens your eyes, you can see the solution to your problems. You can see the barrier to your progress. And story number three is we see the defense for what's attacking us. You know... It's so important so often in life to realize that there are times in life when we are being attacked, we're under threat, there are problems, difficulties that are really attacking us. And every one of us at different points in our life feel under attack. You might be feeling under attack today, right now, at this moment. You might be feeling under attack from germs that are, that are, that are infecting your body and causing you to be, to be uh, sick. You might be under attack because you've lost your job and you don't know which way to turn. You might be in debt and uh, and not knowing your way out of it. You might feel under attack from friends, former friends. You might feel under attack from your family. You might even feel attacked from your own mind and fears and and worries and and, and things. And You might even feel under attack because you feel alone. You don't feel like there's anybody there with you. Well, a great story in 2 Kings chapter 6 uh, of Elisha and the Arameans um, uh, is, a, is a great illustration of this, of, of uh, eyes being opened. The nation of uh, Aram was always at war with Israel. Now, the thing what happened was is that the, the king of Aram would make a plan to attack Israel. But when he made that plan, God told Elisha what the plan was. And guess what Elisha did, the prophet of God? He told the king of Israel the plan. So what happened? Israel won. Because they knew. If you know what the enemy's going to do, you're, you're, it's easy because you then build your defense, don't you? You build the way. So this happened over and over again until eventually the king of Aram gets quite upset and he thinks there's somebody in my palace that's telling my secrets and even the things that are discussed in my bedroom 
they're going and the king of Aram knows. And so, of course, he's looking for the traitor. He thinks there's a traitor in my midst. But you know what? The guys around said, no, there's no traitors in your household. No traitors in the palace. But there is a prophet in Israel. And he keeps telling the king of Israel what is going to happen. And so in verse 6, uh, it says, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. This happened, you know, the leak. Several times, so the king of Aram became very upset over it. He called in his officers and he demanded, which of you is a traitor? Who has been informed, the king of Israel, of my, of my plans? It's not us, my lord. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet of Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. And so, guess what, guess what he does? The king of Adam, what does he do? He decides he's going to send his army to get Elisha. Now, I don't know about you, but you've only got little Elisha, and he thinks he needs an all-army. Yes? I don't know about you, but he obviously didn't have the SAS in their days. (laughs) But, uh, but he sends the army. Now, of course, what's fascinating is when the army comes, Elisha's servant, there's just the two of them in the city called Dothan, and, uh, and, and they, are, they see him. The servant sees him, wakes up in the morning and sees that they are surrounded by this vast army, and he runs to tell Elisha, and Elisha, and he says to Elisha, he says, look, we are surrounded, we are outnumbered, we're goners, it's no, you know, we've, uh, uh, our end is nigh, as it were. But then Elisha says to his servant, those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Now, many of us know that little passage, you know, often forget where it, it's in. But what, but what happened was, is Elisha said to the servant, uh, said, said, pray to God and said, open his eyes that he may see. And when the servant's eyes are open, this guy called Gehaz, Gehaz, he says to him, he says, that um, um, Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's hearts and he looked out and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Yes, in other words, He sees it. He couldn't see before. All he could see was the army uh, of the enemy. But then when his eyes are opened, he can see the heavenly armies that are there, that were invisible, that now he can see them. Yes? Amen. And what I find fascinating, though, is that um, (coughs) it says here, the rest of the story says this, as the Aramean army advanced towards them, Elisha prayed, Oh, Lord, please make them blind. And the Lord did as Elisha asked. So Elisha went out and he told them, you have come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. So he's prayed. The whole enemy army is suddenly blind. They can't see who he is. They don't recognize him. And so Elisha says, no, I'll take you to, to where you need to be. And so he takes them on a journey and, um, and, and I don't know how far it is, but there's a difference between 7 to 12 miles is the distance. So 11, 12 miles. That's how long he led this army. It's not like, oh, little days. Not like a little something came over them. This is a long time to walk and to march 12 miles, yes? So how long is that going to take you? Three miles is probably 40 minutes. So three, six, nine, twelve. So that's four, eight, twelve, 160 minutes. And how many hours is that? 3.2 or something. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, is there's, there's hours of this. And where does he lead them? He leads them into the city, Samaria. Guess who's in Samaria? The Israelite army and the king of Israel. And so he leads them all in. And then he says, now, Lord, open their eyes. Can you imagine opening your eyes as a soldier and suddenly realize you are in the enemy's camp? They are surrounded, they're ready, they're armed. Isn't that fantastic? But you see, now let me just say to this, the, the, for, for the story is, is that the king says to Elisha, 
What should I do? Should I just slaughter them? And Elisha very wisely says, no. Feed them, clothe them, look after them, and send them on their way. That's not normal. But I'll tell you what it did do. It made friends of enemies. Because after that, they never ever attacked them again. After that, they had peace. And often when we have enemies, we need to understand, we need to make peace, we need to bless them, we need to look after them, we need to find a way so that they can know that we love them, that we have got their best interests at heart. Amen? So, that's the best way to get rid of an enemy, yes? Is to turn them into a friend. And how do you get a friend out of an enemy? Feed them. Alpha, we're going to feed them. (laughs) And then we're going to hope they become our friend, yes? That's the plan, yes? Because there are people around the world that, that want us dead. They want to kill us, yes? There are martyrs all over the world. I was listening to uh, a young man telling me uh, yesterday that actually that there is, that there is uh, approximately somebody dying for their faith every two hours, if I remember right what he said. There, there's hundreds, there's thousands getting massacred because they believe in Jesus. But one of the things you find, where they are dying for their faith, the, gro- the church is growing. And the old... Um, Church Father Tertullian said this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, if you give your life to Jesus, that seed will produce a massive harvest. That's why we need to die every day so that he can open our eyes and we can be used of him. Amen? So God wants to open our eyes to see all the resources uh, that, that, uh, that we have at our disposable And uh, he's got his angels around us taking care of us. And fourthly, the fourth benefit of being able to see with spiritual eyes is that uh, that we can see how God is walking with us. When God opens our eyes, we can see God with us. And uh, I don't know about you, but often in life people say, I can't feel God. I don't think God's with me. I can't sense his presence on the journey. If you don't think God is with you, you're dead wrong. Because God is with you. The fact is, is you just need your eyes opening to be able to see him. And so I want to share a story on Luke 24. This is the first, uh, this story happened on the day that Jesus rose from the dead in Luke 24. It's the very first Easter, yes, And a lot has happened over the years. And uh, uh, over this, sorry, over the years, over these last 72 hours, Jesus has been uh, been whipped, he's been tortured, he has been uh, crucified, he has been buried, he has, uh, you know, buried in the tomb. And so all of the disciples are crushed. It seems like the dream is finished. And so they said, we thought this guy was God. We thought he was the Messiah. And so, as a result of that, they start to disperse many of them. And although they've heard that, uh, that some of the women went to the grave and they saw that the tomb was empty, they didn't know where Jesus was, and so they just disillusioned, uh, disheartened, and discouraged, and not knowing really where to go. They're just confused and in grief. And so... <clears throat> um, in particular, there's these two guys that are leaving Jerusalem and they're heading off back home to Emmaus. And on this journey to Emmaus, um, Jesus comes alongside them and hears them talking, and they're obviously talking about the day's events. And uh, Jesus just comes along and talks to them. And this is where we pick it up in verse 15. Suddenly, Jesus himself came along and joined them and began walking beside them, but they didn't know who he was. Because God God kept them from recognizing him. Jesus said, you seem to be in a deep discussion about something. What are you so concerned about? They stopped short, sadness written on their faces. Then Cleopas said, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened in the last few days. And Jesus said, what things? He was the center of 
the things. He knew exactly he was just playing ignorant. And the disciples said, the things that happened to Jesus, the man of Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did wonderful miracles. He was a mighty teacher, highly regarded by both God and all the people. By our leading priests and all the re uh, religious leaders arrested him, handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had thought he was the Messiah, the saviour of the world who had come to rescue Israel. They all happened, that all happened three days ago, they continued. Then some women were at his tomb early this morning and came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and that they had seen angels who had told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea and sure enough, Jesus' body was gone just as the women had said. You see, they hadn't seen Jesus and they hadn't recognized him. And of course, then Jesus talks to them, he explains all the Old Testament scriptures to them and uh, goes through them. He quotes passages from Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all the prophets um, and, uh, and shows them that. Because the Bible, as I mentioned the other week, is not about Israel. The Bible is about Jesus. Old Testament, New Testament and the Acts and uh, the letters that were, that were written afterwards, it's all about Jesus. And so it's important that they, in their grief they could not see. But then Jesus opened their eyes so that they could see. And once they could see, of course, Jesus disappeared and, uh, and went elsewhere because over the next 40 days he appeared to many people. At one time he, he appeared to 500 people. And so he was doing. But I don't know about where you are today, you may feel in this situation of these amazed disciples, you may feel lost, you may feel discouraged, you may feel despondent, you may feel you've lost your hope. You may feel that, you know, the things that you had dreamt about are never going to happen now. I can't see God with me in this journey. It seems like God's just not walking with me. I'm not seeing his blessing. I'm not, not hearing him talk to me. I want to say to you, God wants to open your eyes today so that you will see that he is with you, that his presence is with you, and he is walking with you. You know, when God opens your eyes, you see the solution, you see the barrier, and you see the protection, and you see that he is with you. So how do you get that kind of illumination? Well, there are five things, and I'm just going to rush through these really quickly. Uh, things. The first thing is you must begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, a, that, that's the base. Until you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, a connection with him, you're part of the family of God, um, then you're not going to be able to, uh, to, to see what God wants you to see. The second thing that you've got to do is you must ask God to open your eyes. You've got to ask in faith, Lord, open my eyes. We've, we've just memorized that verse, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your Law. Yes, in other words, that's, that's something we should probably read every time we come to the Bible. Lord, I'm about to read your word of God. Please open my eyes so that I can see in your word today the wonderful things. I want to say to you, there are lots of wonderful things. It's jam-packed with wonderful things in the word of God. Thirdly, we need to come with a humble attitude. If we come to the word of God, and we go, okay, God, I know you've talked about such and such, but, you know, I'm just, I think this way is best for me, or no, I'm, I, I don't understand that, Lord, or I don't, I don't see how that could work out, or whatever it might be. If you don't come to God and the word of God, if you don't come saying, Lord, I need you to help me uh, to see things in my marriage, or in my finances, or in my career, or in my relationships, whatever it might be, then you're coming with a, a proud heart and we've got to ask him. Yes, Psalm 25 verse 9 says, he guards the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him in your finances. Acknowledge him in your marriage. Acknowledge him in your workplace. Acknowledge him in every area of your life and then he will make your paths straight yes so we've got to do that we've got to ask God to um, to open our eyes in faith we've got to come humbly between before him and fourthly we've got to have our heart cleansed from sin and conflict 
Uh, that the, the, the two things. One is we've got to understand we've got to have a pure heart. Matthew 5 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That doesn't mean perfect, but it does mean we keep confessing our sins. We come to God and we ask for cleansing and uh, we renew it. But not only that, we need to know that we, we mustn't be in conflict. In other words, in our relationships, you can't be right with God and wrong with people around you. Yes, if, you, if there's somebody in your life that, 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 that you've got a wrong relationship, you've got some bitterness or resentment or something or other that's causing your thing, I want to say to you that that will affect your relationship with God. So you have to sort that out. Yes, what John 2, 11 says there, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and he walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going. So in other words, you just can't do it. If you want to have the light of the Word of God, when you're reading the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, uh, researching the Word of God, and reflecting on it, you need to be in a right relationship with both God and man. And that might mean today that you need to make a phone call this afternoon. It might mean you need to write a letter. It might mean you need to do something practical in order to, to, uh, to get this right. And fifthly, and lastly, uh, you've been very good with me to this morning, Commit in advance to do what God says. Unconditional, unqualified obedience is required to have the word of God enlightened to you, yes? In other words, you've got to be able to come with it and, uh, and, and say, God, I'm, whatever your word says, I'm going to do it. Whether, whatever that, whether that's to do with my wife or my kids or my business or my finances or my career or my education, whatever it might be, and I'm going to do it, Lord, even if it doesn't make sense, if I don't understand it, if I don't agree with it, if it isn't popular, if it isn't easier, Lord, I'm going to still do what you ask. I remember a prayer that I've prayed for a long time. Um, I got this from, uh, from Ralph uh, Neighbor, and uh, he, this is the prayer. He says, I am willing to receive what you send. I am willing to lack what you withhold. I am willing to relinquish what you take. I am willing to suffer what you inflict. I am willing to do what you command. I am willing to be what you require. That, I believe, should be our prayer today. I hope today that you will just accept, if you've never accepted Christ, accept Christ today. Uh, but if you have, then if you want to, to know the word of God enlightened, then if you put these five things into practice and make sure you're clean, make sure you're right with God, make sure you're speaking in faith and you're being obedient and the word of God will live like it never has before. Amen.